as I go about packing all of the stuff that I'm going to put into the camper, I'm occasionally reminded that I'm not going to be able to take this and that with me because, well, I was, I was robbed. Somebody came in here and ripped me off. But I also want to talk about the loss that many of the 4x4 accessory equipment manufacturers, most of them are small businesses, family businesses, how they lose out when other mostly small, mostly family businesses rip them off by blatantly copying their designs. I'm Andrew Cynthia White. Join me as I share my passion for building four-wheel drive trucks and traveling to the remotest parts of the world. I came in one Sunday morning. It was almost exactly a year ago, just under a year ago. And Graham Saracy's troop carrier was parked here. He's the one that I built, uh, the autograph one I built. And here was my beautiful green troop carrier. Now what I'd like to do with vehicles that I buy on behalf of clients and I build them for them is the first thing I do is I take the vehicle, I bring it here, test drive it, make sure it's okay, charge the battery, get the battery good proper proper charge and that's what I did with Graham's vehicle and so when I arrived in here his vehicle was open and the moment I noticed something was was amiss was when I noticed that the charger which was connected to this cable here was gone and secondly my troopy the bonnet was closed i left the bonnet open because i was charging that battery as well i had two chargers running because i would do it every now and again just give the start battery a boost and very quickly i realized that i'd been ripped off and they had taken the chargers they had taken a bag that was under here and thrown its contents onto the floor there were straps and things and used the bag to carry stuff so the charges were gone. Question, why do you think they closed the bonnet? Why? I know why. They closed the bonnet because there were fans. They wanted to see what the car looked like. And they had seen on previous videos how to get in. They came around the side gate and went in through the back roller drawer that I didn't bother locking. What they then did is they went through here and they started offloading stuff. Now at the time, unfortunately for me, half of the stuff they nicked was inside the troop carrier, but half of it I had taken out of the back. They couldn't have got into the back because they, to get into the back they would have had to open the garage door which would have made noise, which they didn't do. So the stuff that they nicked was half inside the vehicle and half there. So I didn't get much of a claim, but I did get a bit. But that was not the point. It wasn't about money because the stuff they stole, to, for example, they, they stole a small angle fridge. They nicked some blades. Some of the blades were inside because I would keep them, some of them, in the passenger door. I still do it to this day. I put stuff in there. They took those. They took torches from inside the car. So the only door that opened in the troop carrier was this door. So they leaned in and they grabbed what they could. Okay, apart from the angle and the two battery chargers, my Leatherman, my beautiful Leatherman. That was inside the car in the center console. I actually had my name engraved on it. They nicked that. That's my second. The other Leatherman, I, I was stolen from my tent in Mozambique many, many years ago. They took an AG drill charger. They took... Uh, my GME little portable, those beautiful little portable GME radios, UHF radios, beauties they are. LED lenser, um, I had one, one left. It was a beauty, the P17, the big one. But here's my little new baby. Now this is a very high powered, multifunction electronic torch. And a silky nato, it's a silky nato as a cut, cutting blade. Something like this. This is a silky, heavy panga. That is an incredible blade. I could shave with it. But the two worst things, the two things that really get to me, and just even now, they just, they just... Uh. My mate Jeremy, 
<laughs> bought me as a present, as a gift at Overland Expo West in 2016, a Holtzbrook hand axe. Keep walking, Mr. White. I just, it was just such a nice tool. And they nicked it. They stole it. Uh, the other thing, and probably the mo well, there are two other painful items. The other one was a Swiss Army knife, the full stack Swiss Army knife, but it was white. And if anybody sees it, it has a very distinctive short crack in the plastic casing. I purchased that, I remember the week that I bought my first powered aircraft. I bought that as a little t mini toolkit that I would take flying with me, put it on my belt. And it was in, would have been in 1993, I think. And the aircraft was called a Grob 109. Beautiful, beautiful aircraft. And I, that, I really learned how to fly in that airplane. <clears throat> Did some amazing trips, amazing, amazing trips. Long distance, over deserts and things. The other thing, and probably the most painful item out of all of them, is my small video tire pressure gauge. I bought that the week that I bought my Range Rover in 1982. It's been my standard go-to tire pressure gauge since then. Corrugations. And it's gone. Okay, it was a beautiful it's little patch. The tires are too hard. So anyway, so now you feel sorry for me. Good. Now I'm going to talk about four-wheel drive industry. Four-wheel drive industry supports a lot of people, a lot of families all over the world. A recent commenter said, oh, haven't we gone too far? Haven't we lost the essence of four-wheel drive? Because you can now buy all of these gadgets and all these companies and, and all these products. Well, we, we'll only, we only l let the magic be lost if we lose it. We are the ones th to decide whether we buy the equipment or not. You don't have to buy the equipment. Has it lost its magic? The opposite has happened because more and more people are doing this. One of the first products I developed myself that was ripped off was a shovel. Now the idea behind the shovel was that in South Africa at the time there were no decent off-road shovels. None. Not one. That was not the case here in Australia. You've had really great shovels in the United States as well. You've had really great shovels for this kind of app uh, recovery application for, for decades. But in South Africa, we had none. So I thought, well, it's time to make one. So I got a team of guys together. We're all mad off roaders. We went down to John Rich's farm down in, in Natal and we got our vehicles horribly bogged. We got them bog bogged in a thick clay mud. We would also get them bogged in a mud that was very, very, it was uh, washed with water, so it was very sandy. So you have one application where the stuff sticks to the, bl bl the blade of the shovel, and you have another application where it doesn't. And, we, and I had made five different shovels that I thought would be, they were all different, different lengths, different blade designs. During my many years of off-roading and during the filming of this program and many others, I began a process of of weeding out the bad shovels from the good shovels. I wanted to make a decision. What was the best shovel to take on board a vehicle? And we handed them around and we got stuck for two whole days and we had an absolute ball. This was a product development thing. And so at the end of it, we decided on that. We all decided that this was the best length because length is not only a good length you need to get under the vehicle, but what about attaching to the side of the vehicle that's too long to... So everything's a bit of a compromise here and there. What kind of handle? Do you just have a pole or do you have something to protect your hands? Or what, do you, what kind of handle is it? What kind of blade is it? What, how wide is the blade? How narrow, etc. We came up with, this will make a superb off-road shovel in most applications. The way we actually had the shovels made was we actually bought a traditional garden shovel and an engineering shop cut, 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 put in a, we, they made a jig so everything would be straight and they reattached the same handle that had been adapted. Now one idea that I came up with is to make it a bright colour. 
because it had happened to me several, several times where I'd actually lost a spade because after a really tough you know, recovery operation, you get everything back into the car, you try and clean yourself off and you drive away and you get to your destination or next time you get bogged and you realize you, you've lost something because it's so covered in the mud that you don't see it because it's painted black or green or whatever. So camouflage spades are just not a good idea. So I thought, okay, we'll paint it orange. Good idea, right? Well, let me explain to you now how good that idea was. We decided to launch it at a trade show. So we had this little stand there. We were selling some videos on driving, some books that I'd written, some... And I thought this was our first pro pro actual, actual accessory product. So we stack them there, and within an hour of the gates opening, they're all gone. Oh, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'll, I'll go to the car. I had 100 made, 100 made. So I go off to the car, and they're a bit clumsy. To, I haven't really got a trolley or anything. So I'm kind of walking back to the stand, and I get interrupted. What are those? The recovery shovels. Oh, they're cool. Yeah, how much are they? 100 rands. They were 100 rands. 100 rands. Okay, I'll take one. No, I'll take two. You want to take two? Okay. Um, put the money in my pocket. Um, okay, take, no, take those two. Okay, thanks. Thank. Oh, you want one as well? And, uh, and I would arrive after picking up eight in the car. I would arrive with one. <clears throat> Bunk. Going back to the car. And I did this the whole morning. And by 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, gone. 100 of them, gone. Wow. Cool. So what happened? A company called Safari Center in Cape Town. Now at the time, and I think it's still the case, they are not part of the Safari Center group in South Africa, which still exists. They were an independent. The owner, who I'd known for years, suddenly on his shelf appeared because he used to sell my books and things. A shovel. Same length. Orange. For 90 rand. Eventually what happened is that they undercut me so much on the price, started selling them elsewhere, that I could no longer sell mine, which was better because they had missed out on some key things in the design. You know, every part of the design was discussed and they had saved money by doing certain things in a certain way and it was not as good as mine. But it was pretty similar. But it wasn't as good. Then, a company called Macro in South Africa. Macro is owned by Walmart. They decided that this spade was definitely a good idea because it was the only really good off-road shovel available. The only alternative was a little garden shovel. The one that they could get was too small, the blade was too small and the wrong shape. And the other one that we had developed ours and built ours from was just far too big and just so heavy. So they obviously thought, well, we'll make a killing. And they developed a shovel. And guess what? They painted it bright red. I reckon seven, eight months later, we said, nah, it's not worth doing anymore. It's not worth doing. So the end result then was that even the Cape Town company that had ripped me off stopped making them. The other one was a puncture repair kit. I was the very first person in South Africa to launch and release the rubber string method, temporary method of inserting a rubber rised vulcanized rubber insert into a puncture. So you get a thorn, you pull out the thorn, you ream the, 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 the hole, you put in the string, and it's a great temporary fix. We use them today, they're sold everywhere today. Fantastic, and I recognized the value in this the moment I was introduced to it. Because somebody importing the components said to me, don't you think this is a good idea? And I said, absolutely. So I created a kit, a little metal box, and we did a little bit of research and we created a beautiful product. Now that store macro that I mentioned that had ripped off my shovel, 
they saw it as a great idea and said, well, we'll, we'll order 200 of them. But the guys like the Safari Centers and the other four drive accessory stores in South Africa also recognized that this was a great idea. And so they ordered it for us and we had a good little business. It was really good. It was supporting local people, local importers, and it was, we would have certain little things in the puncture repair kit actually made for us. It was a cool kit. It was a very, very nice little kit. So eventually we negotiated a price and I, I think it was probably three or four, 500 units. It was a lot of units. There was a lot of money involved. I remember I had the, my little kids that were this high at the time, packing boxes and everything in the kitchen. We had piles of them everywhere. It was a family business. It was killed by the big guys because they turned around after the second order and said, okay, we'll order another 400, but this is the price. And eventually I said, no, what's the best price you can do? That's the best price I can do. No, you have to come down. I said, I don't have to do anything. And they said, well, in case we're not going to order. And I said, let me put it to you this way. This is a face-to-face -face meeting. I'm not going to do something for you and not make any money out of it. Like you, I need to earn income and generate profit from this deal. Just like you do. You are asking me to do this and earn no profit at all. In other words, you want me to work for you for nothing. It's not going to happen. So that's my minimum price. You can take a leave. And they said, well, we'll leave it. Was this a train smash? Well, not really initially, because the other small centers were still buying from me. But what happened then? Macro contacted somebody else and said, I want you to make that. I want you to make that, and that's what I want you to sell it for. And they did. So what happened? All of the other centers who were buying our product couldn't compete with Macro, who were cut price selling this thing, so they stopped buying ours. They then bought from the macro store. They could get it from the macro store. I knew how much it cost to make that kit. They would buy it from the macro store, mark it up with a tiny little markup, 5%, and sell it for less than I could actually produce them for. So I thought, okay, well, fair enough. It's, it was good while it lasted. But, you know, just let it go and continue. But I see in the, all over the world, copycats. I see it in the US, I see it in Australia, I see it in South Africa. Somebody comes up with a really good idea. Now, most of the good ideas, not all, but most, are developed by these small organizations family businesses and there's somebody in the family that has the brains the understanding the know-how and the experience of travel and off-road and that kind of thing to come up with an idea that people will want fantastic because it supports all of these people and then there are others that are dedicated not to creating something new but just making money and all they will do is find a good product copy it often badly, and put it onto the market. They will often copy it and make it for cheaper, because if they can make it for cheaper, then they will get an advantage in the marketplace. Does cheaper mean better? No. We all know that it doesn't. It, cheap does not mean better. Mostly it means worse. But there's more to it than that. Four-wheel drivers, like you and I, we're, f we're family people, aren't we? Almost exclusively. We're all family people. So many of us have our own family business. If you hear about stuff being copied, my suggestion is you veto it. You just say, no, I'm not going to do it. I am going to support local industry. I'm going to support my country. I'm going to support my community. And I'm going to support my industry. And you do that by... Buying local when you can, buying from the originators when you can, even if it costs you a little bit more, 
because know that almost every time that you do that, you'll actually be getting a better product, not just serving the community and specifically the four-wheel drive community that we all love. I hope you've enjoyed my little sharing of my stories of me being ripped off. It worries me that a lot of little businesses in this industry are being ripped off every single day. Thank you for watching.